Good evening, everyone. I, for one, am still trying to get used to our order of worship on Sunday night. So I was sitting in my chair when I was supposed to be up here. I apologize for that. Hope you're doing well. A lot of us in this uh, room this evening have been looking forward to Sunday night services for some time. Uh, I was grown up where every time the doors were opened, we were there. And there's something to me, maybe to you too, about a Sunday evening service that is absolutely unique. There's not another time we meet together during the week that has this unique collection of, of feelings. Uh, we, we end a busy day, we come back together before we leave again to worship God uh, together. And so I'm looking forward to uh, what we look at today. As you can see on the screen, the title of the lesson tonight is The Guilt Problem. And we didn't announce that this morning or during the week because we thought some people might say, I don't want to really sit through uh, talking about guilt. I got a bucket full of myself and I just don't need more piled on. Well, the point of this lesson is going to be that we don't have to have guilt. That's the wonderful thing. The bottom line that we have as Christians who are saved by God's grace, it is up to us how long we carry guilt in our hearts. And there isn't a one of us that wants to carry that guilt one more minute than we need to have to complete God's purpose. So uh, today, again, we're going to be looking at this, and uh, hopefully when we close, there'll be three points that are going to help us deal with our own personal guilt, because I don't care who you are or who I am, every one of us has buried guilt in our lives today. No longer how long we've been Christians, no matter how long, we all have an issue with shedding guilt from our lives. So when we look at the Holy Spirit, we know that the Spirit does a tremendous number of things in our lives. It helps us understand the Word more clearly. Um, helps us pray, we learn from Romans 8. Helps us pray as we ought. There are things that we're not able to utter that God wants to hear through the Spirit. Also, it strengthens our faith just generally as we go through our lives. But there's an important part of what the Spirit does in our lives that uh, we're going to be looking at tonight, and that is it helps us recognize and it actually convicts us of our sin. Now, we don't like to be convicted of our sin, but we must. If we are ever going to be forgiven of that sin, the first step is having that brought to our minds, brought to the surface. And sometimes the, the process of bringing a sin to the surface may be something we've carried for years, that, that eruption, if you will, of that guilt into our consciousness is not a pleasant thing. And it wasn't intended to be a, a pleasant thing. But uh, what we see here is that for Christians, feelings of guilt are an emotional response to realizing that we have sinned against God and others, and thereby we've harmed our relationship with them, and we have diminished ourselves in so doing. Just consider that sentence for a moment, because I think it really captures the whole uh, process of being a Christian going from uh, conviction to forgiveness. But we have to recognize that this is where our guilt is generated, realizing that we have failed. This process is designed by God to take us from realizing our sin, moving us into uh, to guilt, which is the response to that, but moving us to repentance that then re that moves us to forgiveness. Now, this process offers us um, a big question where guilt is concerned, and that big question is when we are feeling the guilt of that sin, what do we do with those feelings? The feelings of guilt that we have. We got two choices. We're either going to take those to the Lord, we're going to turn to Him, and through His grace and His power, that's going to be handled. Or we can turn around and try to ignore the one that has shown us what our sin is and look for comfort someplace else. 
The third option is maybe we're just going to deny it. I was going to say these gentlemen are passing out our, uh, uh, our notes for the lesson. We're going to be in the Word quite a bit tonight. And so uh, most of the scriptures that we'll be referencing tonight are on this list. So I hope that during the week uh, you have a chance to look through this and, um, and learn, learn more about what God's Word has to say to us. So if we're, situ if we're in this situation, we're trying to answer this question, we need to recognize that Satan is on a stage when we are dealing with our guilt. Because there's a lot of things that Satan wants to use this guilt for. He finds opportunity in these feelings that we have. First of all, he wants to turn the spotlight on our failures. Does that ever happen to you? Who remembers what they had for breakfast last Thursday? Quickly, what do you remember for breakfast last Thursday? How did you mess up when you were 19? If you're like me, you can probably remember that. We carry these things in our minds. Just because we remember them doesn't mean that we haven't been forgiven, correct? We understand that. But there are things that we can remember where that guilt has never been assuaged. That guilt has never moved fully into the process of moving us toward God and to repentance and forgiveness. And we're carrying that festering bit of trouble in our hearts, and God knows it is the important thing. The second thing is Satan uses guilt to, um, to attack and discourage us from, from moving forward in our walk. It really can be a weight around our necks, can't it? Well, when we looked about Satan uh, turning the spotlight on our failures, there's a, a gentleman by the name of King David, perhaps you've heard of him, who had more than one reason to carry guilt around in his life. And as a matter of fact, no one really is immune from this. And let's just read some words from David's own mouth. We're going to be in the Psalms quite a bit tonight because quite frankly, the Psalms deal with guilt in such a beautiful way. So let's look first at Psalm 38, verses 4 through 6. Words of David. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day I go about mourning. And then we're going to look at a very famous verse that we all know very well. It's in Psalm 51, verse 3, when he tells us, For I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. So the fact is we share David's capacity to remember our failures. We're going to talk about David in a little bit more depth in just a couple of minutes. But the, the fact is that we are all really in, in the same boat here. When we talk about how Satan seeks to discourage us, there are so many places we can look in God's Word that can describe the discouragement that comes along with unforgiven sin, that, that pondering, that lingering guilt in our hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. Paul is writing to a congregation about the way they treat each other with respect to someone else's sins and failures. Perhaps there was a particular man that he had heard about from them, and uh, this man was perhaps being unfairly um, harmed by the rest of the congregation with, a, with a, an attitude that was not forgiving. And he tells them the reason, you need to be forgiving this person as I have, and I'm going to tell you why. So these are his words to them, starting again with verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you is to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Verse 11 is crucial. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Again, Satan finds opportunity in our guilt. 
Now, Paul was very familiar with Satan's schemes, was he not? When he was writing his letter to first, uh, his first letter to Timothy, fairly near the end of his life, um, he ex- describes himself in that chapter, verse 13, as being a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. It had been years since he showed any sort of behavior we know about having to do with those three things. But here he is near the end of his life, and he is still remembering, almost categorizing himself as being this type of person in his heart. Later on in that chapter, in verse 16, he talks about the fact that um, I am the worst of sinners. If you look in your Bible, it's going to be in the present tense. He doesn't say, I was. He says, God shows some tremendous grace to me because I am. I exist in my mind as the chief of sinners. Paul clearly understood grace. Paul clearly had been completely forgiven of those errors in his life out of ignorance. But still, he carries the memory of that. So as we look at uh, some of the situations that we have to deal with, Satan wants us to become mired in our guiltiness. Do you believe that's true? And the reason Satan wants us to become mired in our guiltiness is because of this. Feelings of guilt are closely associated with regret. Unresolved guilt can grow into severe, life-altering regret. Do you know anybody in your life who has been, has had their life changed by unresolved guilt? Plenty of them. Plenty of us. Well, good news is that God created the ability to experience feelings of guilt. Those feelings were created by God. They are emotions that God put into our heart and into our spirit. Those emotions are not to condemn us. They are to move us. Again, that's the decision point when we talk about a guilt problem. Which way will we move when we have the um, inescapable situation when we are feeling guilty? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in other words, why this is so important. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly grief or sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation with regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. The key here is that we transform our guilt pangs into godly sorrow not worldly sorrow, and not into destructive remorse. Destructive remorse is festering guilt, is it not? So we want to avoid that at all possible costs. Now, the point of the lesson is this, and I'll leave this up here for just a moment. Carrying unresolved guilt can be debilitating. So we must learn that God's capacity to cure it is completely sufficient. God created those emotions, and He created the solution to them. And it's important in our walk uh, with Christ, the the more we mature, the closer to the surface this realization becomes, so that we quickly turn in that process to repentance and forgiveness, and we don't let that settle in us and sometimes turn into unresolved guilt over years and decades. Okay. Now, we enjoy studying verses that talk about how willing God is to forgive us, don't we? We love those stories. We like to look at what God has to say about how generous He is in forgiving us. We think maybe of verses such as Psalm 86.5 from a psalm that David wrote. 86 verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. We want that verse 
on our refrigerator door, don't we? We want to be reminded of that great verse because it helps us understand God's complete nature. Well, perhaps we also like Luke chapter 15, where we read um, in the first several verses about, or the, the last several verses of that chapter, about the prodigal son. We love that story because of the ending. And the ending is God, as the father figure, is searching on the horizons for the return of his sinful son. We love that image because that's us, right? And we love the fact that he's looking for us. And so we preach and we preach and we study and we study on that parable so many times. And that's a wonderful thing, again, to have in the front of our minds. Or perhaps we um, really enjoy John chapter 8. First several verses of that talk about the woman caught in the act of adultery. The Pharisees publicly condemn her. We have to remember this was occurring during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, the temple courts where this occurred would have been absolutely jam-packed with Jews. This was not something happening in a corner. We have this woman, probably a setup, dragged before Jesus and all the rest of the people, and we know the story. And in just a few sentences, and some scratching in the, on the ground, Jesus disarms the Pharisees who are judging her in the presence of everyone. But the third thing he does is he condemns her and says, you'll never ever be, amount to anything, right? It's not in any translation that I've read. He says, there's no one here to condemn you, neither do I condemn you, but go and leave your life of sin. We love that story because her guilt was unquestioned. She absolutely caught in the act, no question. She deserved whatever punishment, which involved stones, that uh, Jesus might have said, okay, let's go ahead and do this to this woman. Now, as much as we enjoy those stories, when we study other stories that talk about how God works to bring sin into somebody's mind who may not have wanted to know about it, who may have denied it, who may have wanted to look the other way. The lessons we learn as to how God accomplishes that in people's lives, sometimes we don't enjoy studying those scriptures so much because they start feeling a little personal. We start saying, you know, I'm feeling a little too much like David here. And we're, we're troubled by that, but that's good. Being troubled is good, right? We're going to look at four people very quickly. Two in the Old Testament, two in the New. They're going to have several common threads, but we're going to see, first of all, how God brought the sin to their attention and then how they reacted to that knowledge, how they reacted to the guilt that we know absolutely they felt. First one is Job. Now Job is just a, a great example, I think, and I, I really enjoyed our, our class on Job. When we study the book of Job, sometimes we talk about the fact that, well, this Job was suffering all these excruciating, painful things he was suffering because uh, God wanted to make an example of him. Sometimes we'll say it was unmerited suffering, but we know if you attended that class that there was a reason that Job suffered. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to why it was God allowed Job to suffer? His pride. We are told that Job was self-righteous. God loves so many things about Job, but he could not stand that aspect of his character, and he was going to give Job the opportunity to change it. So we look at Job 32, verse 1. This is after his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, had finished all of their soliloquies. And... We read this verse, uh, Job 32, verse 1. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Well, God takes this little bit of information a step further because the fourth friend, Elihu, shows up. He's been silent during the whole first 32 chapters of this book, and now he's going to say something. And what he says is this, and this is absolutely God's inspiration in chapter 33, verses 8 and 9 talking to Job, but you have said in my hearing, I heard the very words, 
I am pure and without sin. I am clean and free from guilt. Amen. God bless you, Job, for being free of guilt. Well, God knew, obviously, that that was not correct. And so in the next four chapters, God spends some time humbling Job. And how does he accomplish that? By telling Job he's an idiot? By telling Job that he's a worthless servant? No. He tells him in four chapters, I'm God, you're not. That's the way he handles it. And and the funny thing is, if you can find humor in this, after God has just asked him a few very difficult questions, Job acts like, okay, I got it. And he says, no, you don't got it. I'm not finished yet. And the litany of questions that he asks Job, which are, of course, unanswerable by Job, is painful to read, but you need to read them. Because God is doing what He knows He must do, going to the lengths and the extent He knows He needs to go to impress something upon Job. And finally, Job gets it. So, a beautiful response that he makes is in chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. And we can each feel for Job right down to the soles of our feet. When he says these things, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God made his point. Job's guilt has been brought to the surface. And God's guilt, Job's guilt has served its purpose. It has moved him into repentance. And this is heartfelt repentance. And what does God do after that in Job's life? The epilogue in the last chapter says Job was blessed more than he was at the beginning. But it was only because he did not end up maintaining a guilt problem. He was able to move beyond that, and God immediately blessed him. That's the first thing we need to remember. Okay, David. I love David. Even though he's a king, he's an awful lot like us, isn't he? Don't we see things in his life that look very much like ours? I know I do. But you know, God, many times in his life, shines a bright light on, bright light on his shortcomings. We get to 2 Samuel chapter 12, or chapter 11 and 12. We find out that uh, David has committed an astonishing number and depth of sins surrounding his adultery with Bathsheba. And he has gone for months, months, ignoring it, not repenting. Bathsheba getting more and more pregnant every day. Him seeing her in the palace, seeing what was growing inside of her, and still, apparently, no repentance. So what does does God do? He sends Nathan to make a point. So Nathan tells him a story. In 2 Samuel 12, you recall the story. Rich man and a poor man in a particular city. Rich man has gigantic flocks and herds, and this poor man has this one little ewe lamb. His only possession of importance, he drinks, it drinks out of his cup. He even sleeps in the same bed with this beautiful little ewe lamb that he loves. So this rich man has a guest come into town, and instead of slaughtering one of his own flock, what does he do? He takes the ewe lamb of the poor man, slaughters it and gives it to his guests. And what's David's response? The the shepherd. He was furious. This man deserves to die. Repay everything before we kill him four times. And then what is Nathan's four-word response? Say it. You are the man. You are the man. You're it. We're told that David's eyes opened. And you talk about floodgates of guilt. David had an amazing amount of guilt that he had to unpack, right? 
First of all, here's his pregnant wife. Uriah, her once faithful husband and faithful soldier in David's army, is dead in a grave, rotting, because of him. He has indicted Joab in the process. The army who stood back and let Uriah uncharacteristically be killed. All the messengers involved in duplicity. He, he has this huge amount of guilt on his shoulders. So how does he respond to these loads of guilt? Goes off and does something else? Changes his attention to some other shiny object because I just don't want to think about it, right? Well, no, he wrote Psalm 51. We're going to read a few verses from that. But he didn't write Psalm 51 the very next day. We can be pretty certain of that. He had to deal with the pain of this realization for some time. And more, more than that, Psalm 51 was a very public repentance of a very public sin. Everybody, by the time Samuel wrote this, his uh, situation with Bathsheba was a legend. Samuel's not telling anybody anything they don't already know. So we read these words. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3 and 7 through 9. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Then David has his guilt fade when he, return, when he turns this repentance into praise. It's a very important result we need to remember. He's, return, he's turning repentance into praise. Because then he goes on in verses 7 through 9. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are, my, are God my Savior. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Okay. We know how God blessed David. Was David done with sinning and dealing with guilt? The family of 70,000 Jews would disagree with that. Do you remember? 70,000 of his own nation had, had to die by a plague so that he wouldn't have to put up with his enemies chasing him for a bit. Can you believe that? We don't know how he responded to that, but we know how he responded to this. Okay. Third example, we're going to be looking at the Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter, God bless him. He's another one of those Bible characters that we look at and we just go, <laughs> you know, Peter, sometimes you make me feel a lot better about myself. as we look at um, Peter's story, one of the most poignant stories in his life that helped us understand guilt is just a few hours before the cross when Peter denied Christ three times. When Luke wrote his gospel, he tells us in chapter 1, verse 2, that this gospel has been compiled by eyewitness references. He interviewed a lot of people. And we know from detailed study of the book that one of his most reliable eyewitnesses was Peter. One of the most amazing descriptions that we read about this event comes from Luke, and they most certainly were out of Peter's mouth. We're not secondhand stories that Luke had heard through someone who heard through someone else. This is Peter talking to Luke. And he never forgot that day, did he? You look at Acts 7, and we read these verses in Luke 22, 60 through 62. This is after the third denial. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Peter replied, Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. 
Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. This is what Paul's eyewitness memory is. The Lord turned and looked straight at me. Then Peter remembered the word, and the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. His sin came to the surface quickly. And that was because of a direct con contact with his Savior. That's what it took, direct contact with his Savior to bring the guilt to the surface, but then also later in his life to remove that guilt. We look at how Christ dealt with Peter. And Christ dealt with Peter compassionately, didn't he? After the resurrection, he has his disciples together and he's talking. And three times Jesus asks him the same question. And what's that question? Peter, do you love me? We won't go into the, into the Greek differences that don't come across in English here. The point is, each time, he, Peter would answer yes, and Jesus would say, and here's my job for you. Feed my sheep. When he prayed for him before all this happened, he said, Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. And where you're concerned, Peter, I have prayed that your faith may not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. It's important that that word when was not if. Jesus Christ looked at him, knowing already what was going to happen, and had confidence. Your faith is going to be shaken. It's not going to break. So the Lord dealt compassionately and faithfully with Peter. And every one of us can say the same thing in our life today, right? Looking back at these guilt experiences. Okay, last person we're going to look at is Paul. Goodness, Paul's life. How amazing, huh? Paul's sins of ignorance were exposed in a spectacular way, right? On the road to Damascus. Now, during his ministry, Paul would repeat the story a few times that we read about in the book of Acts. When we get to the one that, that occurs in um, chapter 26, verses 14 through 16, we hear some interesting things. So he's telling the king about that experience. He says, We all fell to the ground and heard a voice saying in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I ask, Who are you, Lord? Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. The next three days in blindness, Paul had a, a lot of time to cogitate on what Jesus has done. Jesus has spiritually thrown him to, into a bucket of ice water with guilt. He looks at his entire life thinking he was honoring the Lord, pursuing honoring the God of Israel, only to find out that he was completely blind and ignorant. Maybe he remembered what Stephen said in his chapter-long defense, giving the entire history of the nation of Israel and saying, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Interestingly, Paul would use Stephen's defense every time he walked into a synagogue and was talking about, it, about the Messiah with a bunch of Jews. And I'll bet you every time he did, he remembered, man, and I remember where Stephen said this. What was I thinking? Yet we do know that he was um, freed from his guilt. He could look back at, it as, back at it as a learning experience, but he was freed from the guilt that otherwise could have weighed him down. So when he's writing to Timothy, again, in 1 Timothy, he talks about the fact that he was shown mercy because of his ignorance and his unbelief. And then he gets down to verse 13, down to uh, verse 15 of 1 Timothy. He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of, who I, of whom I am the worst. 
But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. In this case, Paul assuaged his guilt by turning to obedience for the rest of his life. He apparently did not stew over the fact, look how wrong I have been, although that always hurt him. But he immediately turned that guilt into not just repentance, but now obedience. We've got to remember that obedience is an inseparable ingredient in this process. Simply repenting is not enough in the sense that we need to be showing, as John the Baptist would say, fruits of repentance. The repentance needs to be real and actionable. Okay, so as we wrap this up, I'd like to offer just three of many keys to what we can do to remove feelings of guilt from our hearts. These are very simple, but they are going to affect my life, I'm going to tell you, after studying this. The first one is, we need to remember the reason for God's chastening. Another word for chastening is discipline. There's a reason that we have God in our corner bringing our sins to our attention. And as we've said, it is to create motion. It's to create spiritual motion. You sinned, you recognize it, you feel godly sorrow, and now let's move. Get up, stand on your feet, let's go. Let's not uh, dwell, let's not simmer on this guilt. Learn your lesson, but let's go. The feelings of guilt were created to move us, not condemn us. You read in, chapter, in Hebrews chapter 12, this is all about how God disciplines those He loves to make us better, to prune us, as Jesus would say in some of His parables. But we've got to remember the reason. When we're in the middle of a, of a guilt chapter in our lives, we've got to say, don't don't listen to the voices of Satan trying to make me sit on this. This happened for a loving reason in my life. Okay, second. We've got to realize that we really have no secrets before God. And what that means is, before we have committed this sin, before we are dwelling in this guilt, God knew before we were born that this sin was going to be committed by us on this day. He loves us anyway. Parents, you love your kids. You tell them no when they're five, and you know that when they're 16, they're still going to be, you know, not paying attention. But you know, you don't you don't stop loving them from in you know when from when they're five because you know at 16 they're going to be a mess. Okay, you don't hit the pause button on the love. You say, no, I'm going to I'm going to move you along this track because I want to raise you in a godly manner. God does the same thing with us. But again, we need to recognize that God is never surprised by any of our sins. He's disappointed, but as we've come through our life, He's already built us to a particular point in our life that when that bit of guilt comes along, when that sin is realized, He has already been equipping us from what we are knowing and what we're learning in our walk to be able to deal with that sin. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says that. If we receive a temptation... Any temptation at any time, it's only because God has allowed it in that moment because He knows our level of faith beforehand. If He recognizes in us the faith it's going to take to rely on Him through this temptation, He says, okay, just like He did with Job, except He's not causing us to have sores on our bodies, as far as we know. Okay, so He already knows We've got no secrets. And Paul, I mean, um, David would describe so much, so many beautiful things about uh, this. And I'm just going to read you some verses from those two Psalms. Psalm 69, verse 5, and Psalm 139, verse 4. 69 says, You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. And then in 139, some of the most beautiful verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O Lord, 
know it completely. I hope that as we mature, we look at the fact that there are no secrets in our lives to the Lord and we take comfort from that. We need to fear God, yes, and respect Him. But we should also be aiming to live our lives in such a way that knowing that God sees the darkest corner of our heart, we need to mature to the point where we can say, and thank you, Lord, for knowing that. Thank you, Lord, for knowing things in my life that I don't see yet and bring them to my attention. Help me correct them. When, when David was talking about cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean, you're cleaning something with hyssop. It was a very invasive process. And he says, just search and see if there's any way in me that is not right and perfect it. That needs to be our attitude. The last one. God declares that none of our failures are forever if we repent. It's very simple. Everyone in here could have written this item and you could have come up with those two verses. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. They are part of our victory statement. But the fact is, our victory, if we repent and are faithful, our victory is assured. There is absolutely no reason for us to allow Satan to hammer guilt so deeply into our hearts and so deeply into our character that we can't get past it. We don't need to always stump our toe on how we're feeling with these guilt feelings that come through our hearts. We don't have to do it. And it's one of those guarantees from God. I love God's guarantees. God never changes. And it doesn't make any difference if we've been at this following Christ thing for 50 or 60 or 70 years. None of us is, um, is, is immune from feeling these bits of guilt problems in our minds, but they do not need to become a problem. They need to become a testimony. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Um, don't know what your situation is. Don't know if there's something you've heard in God's Word tonight that maybe reminds you of something that's going on in your own life. If there's something you'd like us to pray for tonight in that regard, we're happy to do that. Or if you are still not a member of God's people who can claim these promises, we'd ask you to come and take care of that through faith and repentance and baptism for the remission of your sins tonight as we stand and sing.